Hey guys, and welcome to my video. No, this isn't a severe case of yellow fever. This guy actually is made out of 3D scanning data I produced using nothing but my smartphone. And today I'm going to show you how I did it and most of all, how you can do it yourself. I know what you're thinking right now. Yeah, another photogrammetry tutorial. Let's watch this guy take 50 photos out of different angles and calculating a 3D model out of that. But we actually don't use photos in this case. We use a video. And the best thing about it, you don't even need a good smartphone. You can use any camera. Okay, maybe not any camera, but any phone. Okay, maybe not any phone. Well, you get the point. As you all know, a video is just a bunch of pictures played back fast enough to trick your brain into thinking it sees movement. We can use this to our advantage to get 3D scanning data with lots of information. But why is taking a video so much better than just simply taking pictures? To understand that, we first have to understand the process of photogrammetry and its biggest flaws. And after that, I am going to show you what videogrammetry does better. So let's dive right in. Oh, right, the video. Photogrammetry is a well-known process for the production of 3D scanning data. Mostly it is used to 3D scan organic objects or big objects such as buildings and landsides. But I think the most popular use of photogrammetry is 3D cell. The more angles and photos you take, the better your scanning results will be. But that's where photogrammetry has its flaws, especially if you're doing it by hand. Without knowing, you bring in three possible ways of failure. Number one, inconsistency. You start out spacing your photos pretty well, but the more photos you take, the lazier you get. And I don't blame you for that. It is a very tiring and tedious process, and it's hard to stay focused. <clears throat> so the later in the skin you are, the less information the camera gets. Number two, technical difficulties. Every time you press the trigger of your camera, it will refocus. So if you don't take your time to set the focus onto your object every time, it will focus on different parts of your object. The trick is to find one item, one detail, and focus on it. Or worse, even different parts of your picture. In addition, you have to move closer or farther away of your object due to space constraints. Number three, time. Your lighting in your background is going to change over time while you're taking individual photos. To prevent motion blur, you have to stop, trigger, wait a bit, move again, take the next picture. This process can take hours at a time. If you rely on natural light sources, it will change the appearance of your object, no matter what you do. Why these errors are a deal breaker for this process will be explained when you learn how a photogrammetry software is actually calculating a 3D model out of your photo. The software basically guesses the position of your camera in relation to your 3D object. It does this by comparing your photo to the next one and the one before it. How does it do that? In our three-dimensional world, points on different distances to the observer move at different speed if the observer moves. Just think about your last train ride. While bushes and trees close to you speed by, the trees in the background seem to move slower. If you now have several layers of objects, like here, the trees in the foreground, the little village in the middle, and the woods in the background, you can determine the distance between them. Not the total distance, but the relations of these objects to one another. That's what the software does. But instead of comparing objects, it compares pixels. Smaller scale, it would look like that. The camera attaches to this point and this point in space. And while it moves, it measures the change in distance between these points. And that's why you need so many photos. So the data set is fine enough for the program to recalculate the position of every pixel several times. 
just to be sure. Now I think you understand why a sudden move closer to your object in the next photo is such a bad thing. Don't get me wrong, the program doesn't look on the exact same pixel of your photo every time. It will look at easy to identify features of your part, such as sharp edges, unique textures, or a sudden change in contrast. By moving closer, you introduce uncertainty because the program tracked a feature in the last picture and it was made out of, let's say, 10 pixels, and it decided to place its tracker right in the middle of that. But now you moved closer and the same feature is now made out of 100 pixels. Now it has to decide again where to place its marker. If these changes happen a lot, your point gets basically fuzzy. Your 3D model will be less detailed to compensate for that. That an inconsistent spacing is a problem starts to make sense as well. Now one fixed point is visible in less photos. So the position of this feature will get weaker and weaker or even fail. This is exactly why professional 3D scanners like this have so many cameras, precise spacing focused on one point. That being said, why should the video do better and how does it work? We use a video to give the program more data to work with. A video is just a rapid succession of pictures. Modern phones are capable of taking 4K videos with about 60 frames or 60 pictures a second. Because of the rolling shutter of modern phones, we don't get motion blur introduced as long as we don't move way too fast. I know what you're thinking right now. The problem with focus and distance still exists. Yes, but we have information in between. So your fixed point is still dissolving into more and more pixels, but the program has now the information from in between. It sees the gradual change and can make a better decision where to place the marker each frame. You walk constantly, so your 3D scan will take way less time. So your unique feature dissolves into more pixels, but the program has time to adapt. So the only thing changing in our process is that we take our photos out of a sample of thousands instead of just having 50 to 90 pictures. Now that we understand all this theory, let me show you exactly what programs you need, how to prepare your part, and how to prepare your surround. You started this. Show me everything. We will look at preparing your surroundings, preparing your part, the do's and don'ts, the scanning process, how to get your data out of the video, calculating your point cloud, cleaning your point cloud, calculating your 3D model, and a quick look into cleaning up your 3D model. First of all, we have to make sure that we can scan our object in one continuous motion. You are able to stitch together videos though, but you have to make sure that you don't move your part in between. Get your model on an elevated position and make sure you can scan it from as much angles as possible. You should be comfortable at all times to make sure you're not rushing and you can keep the camera still. A gimbal or a steady cam works the best for this task. But if you don't have one of those, just try to keep your camera very still. Because your phone is taking so many pictures a second, this scanning method is really forgiving. Make sure you have plenty of room to walk around and remove any obstacles. <laughs> Lighting plays a very big role. Any shadows cast by or onto your object will be visible in your 3D scan. Try to get as flat lighting as possible by, for example, closing the curtains or choosing a cloudy day when you're scanning outside. I use my filming lights here. Choosing and preparing your part is important. The more textures or details it has, the better the scan result will be. The part has to be stable and not moving. Scanning your favorite pet isn't a good idea. I found out that organic forms work way better than, for example, technical parts. If your part doesn't have that many details or texture, you can always at some point spread around your parts to give the program something to drag. You could use a water removable marker for that or add glue dots. This is glue, strong stuff. I recommend the retroreflective dots from ISO. Link in the description down below. Try to avoid high reflective parts, unicolored black and unicolored white. Your program will not find any details or textures to track. Of course, a reflective one wouldn't work because it's basically like your camera is looking through it. But if your part happens to be reflective and you want to scan it anyway, you could always add some scanning spray. 
it will just evaporate after an hour and you can spray any surface with it. I recommend the ASUP scanning spray. Also, link in the descriptions down below. By the way, not sponsored by ASUP. Also avoid parts with lots of undercuts. You can test for that by filming your part and looking through the camera. Everything your camera sees will be able to be 3D scanned. Thank you, Ooh. Captain Obvious. Everything you can't see won't. If your part has two distinct sides and you can't get them both in one scan, you have to stitch your scans together later. But because this video is only about the process of the videogrammetry, I will do another video about that later, where I show you how to merge two scans into one successful. Place your object in the middle of your work area and make sure it can't wiggle or move while you're scanning. This one is pretty simple. Just film your part. Fine, I'll do it. Best is to start with a top view and work your way around in a downward spiral. No, not that downward spiral. Best is to imagine there's a rod in the middle of your part and you're trying to film that. But don't worry, even if you move in unpredicted ways because there is so much footage, the program will be able to figure out how you move and will correct accordingly. The key is to have the right distance Keep your part in the middle of the frame and move consistent. If you're scanning a person, he has to keep still for the duration of the scan. As you can see on that footage, her top is moving in the wind. That will mess up the 3D scan. Go to a wind blocked area or inside or use clothes that fit closely to the body. Don't get too close to what you are scanning. Don't get too far away from what you are scanning. Set your camera to the highest frame rate and highest quality possible. If you have an object tracking built into your camera, use it. It helps to keep the object in focus. Take multiple turns if possible. Data preparation, aka how to get your data out of your video. First of all, rewatch all your videos to make sure you choose the best one. If you saw that you have parts of your videos where you lost focus or got blurry, mark down that time. Please do not edit your video. Video compression while exporting will mess up your scan. It is best to cut out later when it's processed. But what do we do with the video now? We change it back into pictures. Hey, wait a minute, what the heck is going on here? But a whole lot of more of them. The easiest way to process your video that I found is this program. Free video to JPEG converter. Link in the description down below. Please don't use an online converter. They will compress your pictures and change the metadata. I suggest that you export between 200 and 400 pictures in an even spacing for every minute of your video. In a 60 frame per second video, you would take about six pictures out every second like that. So videogrammetry is just photogrammetry on steroids. On steroids, lots of them. So the next step to do is watch my video here, where I explain how you get from a video to those little guys. Enjoy. <laughs> 